Welcome back, everyone, to Neighbors in the Network. I'm James Pinedo, your host. We're joined today with a very special guest, Nick Horton from Opportunity Arkansas. Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to, to chat, and I always love talking about Arkansas, so this should be fun. I am excited as well. Nick Horton is the founder of and CEO of Opportunity Arkansas, one of SPN's newest affiliates, launching in 2022. He was born and raised in Arkansas and brings a unique perspective to the impact of policy on the lives of real people. In their first year, Nick and Opportunity Arkansas team notched significant policy wins in the land of opportunity on education, welfare reform, and efforts to make the state's economy more competitive. And they're just getting started. Nick, I'm so excited to hear about all of that and more. But before we jump into the wins, tell us more about you. How did you come to be in this leadership position in the network? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a great question. A great introduction. I hope I can uh, hope I can live up to that. Um, yeah, you know, Arkansas is is my home. It's, you know, where I'm from, where my family's from. It's where I met my wife and my kids have been born and are going to be raised. And, you know, just from a young age, I've always been really passionate about my home state. I think everybody has that to some degree, but even more so, I think, in the South and especially in Arkansas. We're just a we're a really proud state. And I don't think we have ever quite been given the respect uh, that we're due, although we're, we're starting uh, to get there. We're starting to change course on that a little bit. Um, but I, you know, I got really passionate about the conservative movement really from a young age. You know, I was, I was homeschooled for about half my childhood. And then I was fortunate enough to go to a small private school for a few years before I went to college. And, you know, my parents just from a young age really instilled in me, you know, hard work and, uh, you know, conservative values and, you know, pulling yourself up from your bootstraps. Um, I'm one of the only, one of the first people in my, in my family to ever go to college. And I think one of the only folks in my family to have a master's degree. And so this wasn't something that, you know, I, I've gotten a little bit of a reputation out there on, you know, from the Twitter, Twitter verse and the Twitter trolls about, <laughs> you know, having a silver spoon in my mouth and some of this, but, you know, we grew up, grew up really poor. Um, you know, my dad worked two, two and a half jobs most of my life to put us through school, you know, so mom could stay home and school us and then put us through private school for a few years uh, on the back end of that. You know, we, we never really had a lot. I remember distinctly, you know, even when I started going to private school, I, I, I couldn't afford, you know, we couldn't afford the nice clothes that everyone else had. I mean, we wore hand-me-downs and everybody else had the nice, you know, lunch boxes uh, or bought school, you know, we had like Chick-fil-A catered at our school for a while. It was very rare that we could afford Chick-fil-A. Um, but, you know, I always had my brown bag lunch. And, um, you know, it, it was just kind of a humble, modest beginning. Um, but my parents were always, I mean, I saw my dad work like no one else that I've ever seen in my life and probably ever will. Um, we, did, we, we did a lot of volunteering. Uh, my mom started a, a small little food bank pantry uh uh, ministry for low-income women that needed help um, providing diapers and formula for their kids. We start, we worked did a lot of work at a local crisis pregnancy center, um, and that was something that was just always kind of a part of our lives growing up. And so, really, from a young age, I, I've been very passionate about you know making it easier for people to you know climb the economic ladder, for lack of a better term. I know it's a little bit of a wonky term, but making it easier for people to, to rise up and, and out of poverty, certainly have seen poverty all around me and even experienced a lot of it myself. Um, but also seen what can happen with, you know, the, through the power of a good education and a hard day's work. And so that's, that's the future that I want for our state and for the next generation and the generation after that of Arkansas kids. And, uh, you know, we, we've got some, some work to do to make that more attainable, but, there's no reason that it can't happen. So that's a little bit about me. I could talk about myself for probably way too long, but a little bit of background. Well, this is the perfect place to talk about yourself. You're in the right spot. So thank you for that introduction. I had I had a question though. Tell me, um, it seems like you had your own business and were working your own business throughout your entire time going to school, which included when you were getting, a, it was an MBA, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so I started probably when I was about 10 or 11, um, a, a man who 
became a mentor to me, frankly, and ended up becoming my economics professor in college. He was a, a peer of Milton Friedman, um, but he lived down the street. And when I was 10 or 11, he was looking for somebody to help do yard work and help him uh, mow his lawn. And so he brought me on, frankly, paid me way too much, but he was just a very generous man uh, and, and someone I really looked up to. And I realized I could make pretty good money mowing yards not have to go clock in somewhere or, you know, a lot of my friends were going to work at the local restaurant, waiting tables, you know, or doing delivery services or things like that. And I've just never been, I've never been the one for like that type of a rigid work schedule. Uh, I remember finishing grad school and thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but I am not going to have a job where I have to sit in the cubicle all day. I will go insane. Um, so whether it's real estate or sales or something like I am not going to sit in a cubicle. And so I really just, you know, I've always loved the outdoors and I loved being outside in the summer. And I'd seen my dad, my grandfather was a locksmith, you know, had worked in the you know trade industry, blue collar industry his whole life. And one yard led to another yard, led to another yard. And sure enough, yeah, I was able to put together a little lawn care business that supported me all the way through high school and college and, and even through grad school, even up until I got married, um, you know, when I was 25, 26, was still mowing a few lawns just because I loved the work and I had the equipment and, and uh, you know, I was not scared to get outside and sweat a little bit. Right. I think that's <laughs> that's the operating factor, especially in that summer heat that we're all experiencing right now. But tell me, what struck me was that you were a CEO at that time and all through college, you, you were you were running your own business. And now here you are, CEO again. Is there any, am I overstating that connection or is that kind of something like a training ground for you to start your own, your own think tank now? I think there's probably something to that. You know, I mentioned my grandfather who's also named Nick Horton. I call him the original Nick Horton. <laughs> and uh, he, you know, even going back, even going back to his dad, you know, his dad worked for the Tennessee Valley Authority. They lived in Mississippi and moved to Kentucky to help build the Kentucky Dam and the Kentucky Dam Bridge. Um, and then Set, ended up settling and staying in that area. My grandfather went on to work. I mean, he did everything. He owned a gas station. He did construction. Uh, he was a, a milk milkman for a while back when they used to deliver milk to your to your door. Uh, he had a very funny joke. Still has that he loves to tell about you know my dad and and, and, and how my dad really belonged to the milkman. Um, <laughs> and so he he uh, but he turns out he was the milkman. Um, and so he worked you know his whole life he didn't really even retire until he was probably well into his seventies ended up owning a, a locksmith business, which is one of the largest locksmith businesses in Western Kentucky. And, and that just, that line, that, that a lineage of hard work really did get passed down generation after generation. And I, I love telling that story and talking about him. I've even used some parts of that in like legislative testimony at the Capitol, because I think, you know, when you talk about opportunity, Arkansas and the, and the work that we're doing in the history of our state, you know, it's no secret if anybody out there knows anything about Arkansas, we've got a long history with being really poor as a state. We've got a long history with having, in my opinion, frankly, way too much government dependency. We're at a place where at the beginning of this year, we had one in three Arkansans on Medicaid, one in three Arkansans on Medicaid at the beginning of this year. And we've done some work, the governor administration have done some great work even since then to help turn the tide on that a little bit. But we've got really big problems when it comes to uh, work and poverty and dependency. And so that really is, oh yeah, a lot of my, a lot of my personal story and a lot of my background segues with that, but I think it's, it is a, it's a nice match because it also aligns with a, a lot of the generational problems that we, we have here in Arkansas. Well, I, I look forward to hearing more about your plans for fixing these problems, but before we get there, I, I, connect the dots a little bit more for me. So you said you just graduated from you from graduate school and you were saying you'd blow your brains out if you had to do some kind of boring cubicle office job so what was the moment when you're between then and then joining the movement yeah so a little bit a little bit before that it was 09 summer of 2009 and i was graduating undergrad and that was not a super great time to be joining the workforce if you remember folks remember what was happening around that time we were in the middle of the great recession uh, you know, Obama had just come into office and the, the Tea Party movement was kind of taking off. And 
well, we were still in a we were still in a recession, or at least lingering uh, a lingering recession. And I had to kind of decide what I wanted to do. And I knew I didn't work at, want to work in a cubicle, that was for sure. But there wasn't a lot of opportunity. And I, I knew by that point, I wanted to be in the movement. I, I'd gone through some stuff. I'd been through some great trainings at like the Leadership Institute and had some great uh, opportunities in school, even um, even at the school that I went to, which was super conservative. The campus newspaper was very liberal. And so a group of friends and I had actually started our own campus newspaper. And, that, you know, I that really gave me like a really unique outlet that just fed all of my, uh, you know, interests and my passions for policy and politics, but also for writing. And so that kind of took off and turned into an online news site for a while that we ran. And yeah, I I finished undergrad and I realized, you know, I had about six figures in student loan debt uh, in the middle of a recession. And I thought, well, I could probably go try to find a job and maybe move to D.C. or do something else, which I didn't want to do. I wanted to stay in Arkansas or I could do what every other responsible millennial does. And I could get another 50K in student loan debt and go to grad school. And so that's what I did. Uh, I kept doing my lawn business. I ran for city council at some point in there um, in my hometown. And I kept running my online news site while I was finishing grad school. And really, I think just through a series of, you know, frankly, Providence, um, and providential connections and, and 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 a little bit of happenstance maybe, but I think a lot of just purpose that was set in place. Uh, I met I met a guy who was a former state legislator in Arkansas. He was about to start. He said, "Hey, I'm about to start a think tank. You know, I've read your writing. Why don't you come work for me?" Uh, and so I, I went to work for him for about three years and did communications work, social media, emails. Uh, ran our ran our news site for a while. Uh, and that was just, you know, I forget those days because it feels I'm I'm old now. You know, it feels like so long ago. It feels like a lifetime ago. But man, what a great experience and a you know very fortunate experience for me coming right out of grad school to get an opportunity to work in the movement in Arkansas without leaving home, without leaving my hometown. Uh, I met you know a lot, got got my feet wet immediately in the policy world and the legislative world. Met you know, folks from all over the state. We did a bunch of town hall tours. We did a lot of work at the time. Uh, the big topic of debate was Obamacare and Medicaid expansion. And so I, I really developed some Medicaid expertise and some passion for that issue and um, really, really fortunate uh, for that opportunity. And yeah, in a lot of ways, I think it prepared me pretty well to be doing what I'm doing now. Brilliant. So then how did you go from that opportunity to what you're doing now? So because I mentioned Medicaid and Obamacare expansion, so because of that work um, and Arkansas, for better or for worse, really for worse, we got some national attention that was uh, unwarranted or uh, unwanted, I should say, because we did something really uh, dumb, in my opinion. Uh, We didn't just expand Medicaid. We expanded Medicaid in the most expensive way possible. And so rather than just taking this new class of able-bodied working age adults and giving them Medicaid benefits, we said, no, you know what we're going to do? We're going to give them Blue Cross, Blue Shield, private insurance plans, which are twice as expensive, but then they'll go into the Obamacare exchange and then somehow it's conservative because it's competition and they're not really in Medicaid. They're kind of technically in the marketplace. And so um, that became, you know, a really hot button issue, not only in Arkansas, where we saw a lot of legislators and folks that had kind of championed that get thrown out of office. Um, But then a lot of those folks also started traveling to other states and telling folks in Georgia and Wisconsin and Montana and all over the country that, hey, look at what we did. I mean, no, you don't want to expand Medicaid because Medicaid's bad, right? Conservatives all agree Medicaid's not good. It's broken. It's expensive. But if you do it this way, you can tell everybody it's conservative and it's private and it's going to save money. And so um, really, again, I think through Providence, I made some connections with some folks at a, a national state based or a national think tank that worked at the state level, but worked across the country, the Foundation for Government Accountability. And at the time, I mean, they were really solely focused on stopping Medicaid expansion. That was really their bread and butter. Uh, I think it, they were about three years old at that point. So I went in, they, they recruited me to come over and I went to work for them. I think I was 
I was the only researcher. I had a, a boss who's a research director, but I was the only researcher for two or three years. And so I got to get my feet wet even more, go to other states, learn more about their legislative processes and, and um, you know, dynamics in other states, and then go out and tell the story of, you know, what Arkansas did, frankly, so poorly when it came to Medicaid expansion and try to warn other states and, and help them not make the same bad decision that we made. So that kind of led me to that next step. And I was there for about eight years um, until last spring. So here we are. Amazing. Amazing. So the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is you've had, at least in my estimation, a lot of fun. You've done, you've been able to, you know, publish a couple of online news websites and done a lot of writing and learning about this policy, but also in a very story type of way. What's it like now that, you know, is it still as fun now that you're CEO and, and you're doing your, like, you're forging your own path or is it more scary? Uh, no, it's a ton of fun. It's even more fun than I thought it would be. Um, one, I get to work on Arkansas every day and I, and I loved my work at FGA and I loved getting to go to Tennessee and Texas and Montana. I tell you know, my first legislative testimony I ever did was actually in Montana. It was like January 2nd of, you know, 2015 or something. And, I got to the airport in Montana. I had to take like three connecting flights to get there. And I landed at like 1.30 a.m. Go and you know, walk out of this tiny little airport that looks like an old ski lodge. Walk outside. There's literally three, three and a half feet of snow on the ground. And, uh, and my cell phone died right as I was trying to find my rental car. And I'm like, I've never been to Montana before. Like, as far as I'm concerned, I'm in Canada or some other country, you know. And uh, and it was a crazy, crazy experience to go out there and then did like three different legislative testimonies while I was there. And uh, it was a total blast. But, yeah, I, I wouldn't trade any of that experience. But there was a point where it, it, several years ago, even before I had the chance to start Opportunity Arkansas, but there was a point at which I just realized, man, I, I've loved doing this. I've loved traveling. I've loved getting to work on all these different topics. And we did a bunch of work in the White House for several years and getting to go up there and do briefings and things. I mean, it was, it was great experience. Wouldn't trade it for anything, but my passion and my heart has always been in Arkansas and my kids are growing up in Arkansas. And I've told people I've been very you know direct about this. My goal is to trap my kids in Arkansas. I want to create so much opportunity and growth uh, in Arkansas that when they graduate college, which they will hopefully go to college in Arkansas, they won't even consider leaving. Um, right now, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, we're surrounded by two states that have no state income taxes. And so I can tell you dozens of people that I grew up with or went to college with who they finished school and they went to Nashville or they went to Dallas or they went to Houston. Uh, know some folks that went down there and they can make more money. They don't have to pay state income tax. Government mostly stays out of their way great schools. I mean, great. Those are great places to live. And Arkansas has all of those things under the surface, but our, our policies just haven't quite caught up with our culture and our people and, and, you know, where we should be as a state. So I'm having a ton of fun. I, maybe it's, hopefully it's obvious or evident. Um, but I, I, I'm super passionate about Arkansas. I always have been being able to get that experience working in other states on all these different issues getting some fundraising experience, getting a ton of public speaking experience um, and, and just learning things that I'm able to now apply every single day in Arkansas and then taking my, you know, institutional knowledge, for lack of a better term, about Arkansas and our history and the people here and the legislators here and what needs to happen to get us to the next level. Uh, you know, it's it's a it really is a dream. It's a dream I've had for 15 or 20 years to, to run my own policy organization and to be able to do it here in Arkansas is just, there's nothing better. So we're, ha we're having a ton of fun. I haven't gotten scared yet. I'll let you know if that happens, but right now it's just fun. I am glad to hear it. And that's, it is obvious. If you, what you asked, like, is, is this, I hope people can tell, I can tell that there's a lot of joy in what you're doing as I've, been watching what you've been doing. So speaking on that note, can you get, share a specific story that might, you know, come to mind when you've had a, an impact 
that your organization has had in your state and then you've been able to witness it? Oh, man. Yeah, a lot of stories come to mind. I mean, I think, you know, given my work at the my or my first job right out of school and then also when I was at FGA, you know, I was doing a lot of on the ground research work and legislative work and testimony here in Arkansas as well. And so I think I had a little bit of a leg up in terms of, you know, this wasn't just like, you know, Joe Smith got off the bus and decided to start a think tank in Arkansas and he doesn't know anybody. Um, so, you know, that that certainly has been been very helpful. But yeah, I mean, we, we, we started putting our paperwork and our board and stuff together last spring. So March, April of 2022. And we got right to work. I remember in you know June of last year, we had a board member who had a, an old office space in downtown Little Rock, hadn't used it in a few years, just a moldy, you know, office, office space with broken desk chairs. And he was like, Hey, if you need to have some meetings, or you want to use this space, like feel free. And I was like, Yes, I'm I'm taking it. Bought a eight foot whiteboard on, at a yard sale uh, and drug it down to Little Rock, and we just started having meetings with legislators and stakeholders and board members of like, what do we want to be? What's our vision? What's our mission? What are the issues we knew? I mean, education freedom is something I've been passionate about basically my whole life. So we knew that was something that we were going to definitely be involved in, and we had. We had there, there had been a lot of ground tilled on that already. There are groups in Arkansas that have been working on that topic for years and years, and we'd gotten really close a few times, but just couldn't quite, quite get over the finish line. Um, I think once you know one story or like a like a conglomeration of stories that comes to mind out of that is you know conversations in those early days with legislators and other stakeholder groups about education freedom and why couldn't we get over the finish line like what what was the holdup because we're we're a conservative state right and we've got a you know conservative uh you know policymakers in place statewide super majorities in the legislature like what's going on what's the holdup and a lot of conversations a lot of uh learning that came out of that in particular some legislators that i would talk to who would say you know i i wanted to get to yes like i wanted to be a yes last session but no one helped me figure out how to get there. Like no one helped me from a messaging standpoint, from a research standpoint, go back to my district and say, I know this doesn't necessarily help. You know, I'm from a rural district. We don't have any maybe non-traditional schools in my area, but I, I needed someone to help me figure out how to go back and tell my people that I made this vote, but it was, here's how it's good for them. And here's why it's good for Arkansas. And it was just this missing piece of really, again, not disparaging any of the other groups that were working on that because there was great work that was happening. But there was kind of this missing piece of being able to help legislators and policymakers message, for lack of a better term, like what they were doing and why it was important and why it was good for Arkansas. Um, and also, relatedly, telling, you know, helping them figure out how to push back on a lot of the the fake information that's out there about school choice and education freedom. Um, they, there were some, there was some ground that had been tilled there as well, but there was an obvious need for some folks to come in and, and be able to help amp that up a little bit. And so we knew early on that was going to be a core focus of ours. Uh, and we knew we, we were able to determine early on, like what our role in that should be and really own that. Brilliant. So what were the effects of that, very close interaction that you had from these legislators. Well, I mean, I think we saw, so we, we had as well a, a policy summit in December where we were able to bring legislators in from all over the state and some folks from the incoming administration. And again, get it, get out the whiteboard, get out the flip charts and say, okay, we know what's going to be said. We know it's untrue, but how do we articulate it to, you know, our voters, our constituents, you know, people that, that need to understand why this is good for Arkansas. And I think that was a really, you know, that was a really productive process and then really get, you know, getting into session and here comes the legislation and here comes, you know, here comes the, the noise from the other side and really being able to lock arms with legislators and not being scared. I mean, some groups out there, I know everybody has their different approach to how they engage or don't engage in the actual Capitol building. But for us, I mean, our, our philosophy really is pretty simple when it comes to if we're willing to ask, if we're, if we're, if we're 
going to ask a legislator to take an issue on, when we hand them that piece of paper or that idea, we're also handing them our commitment to help them get it done. Um, it's not just a, hey, here's a white paper with some great ideas. I wish you the best and I hope it works out and we'll be over here watching to see how you do. We're really locking arms with them because we're tackling big issues. We're tackling generational problems. You know, when I decided to start Opportunity Arkansas, I made a conscious decision like this wasn't, we're not just going to nibble around the edges. Like I'm not, you know, I've got little kids, I've got other things I could be doing but I'm going to do this. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go big um, because what's not going to happen. What I'm not going to let happen is that 30 years from now, my kids inherit the same problems that I inherited from my parents' generation, which is record poverty, record dependency, record levels of violent crime. That's just not an option. And so, you know, that brings with it a lot of work, uh, a lot of haters, a lot of other things, but you know, I made a decision day one before we ever even launched this organization that like, if we're going to do it, we're going to go big and we're going to work on things that matter and make a difference. Brilliant. I love it. Tell me okay. about um, some of the inspirations that you had along the way, because I've heard you say like you're, you you want to keep your kids, you know, and you said it right now, you want to make sure your kids stay in your state, you know? Because there's so much opportunity and things like that. Is that kind of what you wake up? And I also saw a tweet that you had recently where you were saying, I, I think you quoted, um, your kids are the only ones who are going to remember if you work late. And then you quoted saying, uh, you quoted that tweet saying, they're also the ones who are going to starve if you don't work enough. <laughs> Which I thought was a great tweet. In my, in my estimation. Believe it or not. Believe it or not, I got some hate from that. I got some hate for that tweet. Even people oh, saying, "Look at this guy who said he said he was going to let his kids starve." Um, <laughs> that was that was for sure not the intent uh, of that story. I just think and we talked about this already. Like I think hard work is so important, and and here in Arkansas, like we've just not always done a great job of rewarding hard work. You know, I can talk for days on end about our income tax and how horrible I think it is that we essentially punish. I, I call it a work tax. I mean, that's really what it is. It's a punishment on people for earning a paycheck. And I don't think it's necessarily bad intentioned at this point, but the results, the consequences of it are just as bad. Uh, you know, we, we, we tell people that, you know, we tell kids get out of school, go earn a, a living and contribute to society. And then we take 5% of their paycheck every two weeks. And we, then we turn around and give it to, special interest groups. We give it to folks who are able-bodied on welfare and capable of working, but refuse to do it. Again, one in three on Medicaid, about 400,000 of those are able-bodied working age adults, able-bodied working age adults. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we have, it, it was a, it was a snarky tweet, but I think it's a point worth making that like we've gone through, and as a society, I think you've seen this with micro and like a lot of the, you know, dirty jobs and a lot of that stuff. I think we're kind of starting to hopefully turn the corner on some of yes. this, but work shaming, you know, is a, is a real thing. And yet, you know, what, what, when are we going to talk about like what happens if you don't work? When are we going to talk about, you know, what happens to your family if, if you don't get up or I don't get up every day and go earn a paycheck, you know, that, that has a pretty serious consequence for, for my kids. Now I do think, look, you know, workaholism is not any better. So we got to, we got to always find that balance. Right. But I also think, you know, I'm just tired of people work shaming uh, and discouraging people from going out and, and working hard and sweating a little bit. Cause we need, we need more of that. We need more of it in Arkansas. We need more of it everywhere. I, I'm, I'm wondering though, is that really, if, if I'm going to hang my hat on what drives Nick, is it's, it's, you're thinking of your kids as your inspiration or is there, a, you know, more? Oh, that totally. They're, yeah. I mean, they're, they're the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, any, any time, cause I do have, I do have some challenges. We do have days, you know, there's hard days. Um, certainly anytime you're running a startup and anytime I start to get tired or discouraged, or if I start to wonder like, am I really insane for, for doing this with a six-year-old and a three-year-old? You know, I, I just look at them and I think about, again, I mean, it sounds cliche because it's what you hear in the movies and see in the movies and the politicians, you know, talk about 
what kind of America are we going to leave for our kids and grandkids? And so I, at, at some point in my life, I think I just started like auto tuning all that stuff out. Cause it's like, okay, like everybody's saying the same thing, but then, you know, you go, you get to a point in life where, you know, and I've been through, you know, I've been through some challenges in my personal life, uh, losing my dad about two years ago, almost this month. Um, very unexpectedly, he was 60 years old and I had just turned 33 and here I am, I've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old who are going to grow up and never know my dad. I mean, my parents are big, I mean, other than loving Arkansas, like the reason that we live where we live in Arkansas is, was to be close to my parents and my family and my wife's family. And all of a sudden, really just within a matter of days, you know, my dad was gone and you go through something like that. And folks that are out there that are watching or listening that have been through something like that. I mean, again, it sounds cliche, but it really does at 33 mid thirties, like it, it, you, you take a step back and you start to think about why am I here? Like, why am I here on earth with like big, big question, but also then like, why am I here specifically in Arkansas? And like, God could have put me in anywhere like, you know, Japan, Timbuktu, uh, Montana, where there's three feet of snow. Uh, but he put me in Arkansas and he, and he rooted me here with my kids and my wife and, church community and friends and all these relationships and, and people that I know. And, and, and you start looking at, you start looking back, you look back 30 years and you think like, man, when I was growing up, my parents were talking about the same problems that we're talking about now. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm the, I'm, you know, my dad's age when I was that little kid. And when I'm, you know, my dad's age 30 years from now, what am I going to leave behind for them? And, and, I think there's a moment right now. I know there's a moment right now in Arkansas where we have, we have a limited window. We have a window of opportunity, a window of time that we can get some really, really big stuff done. And we saw it this session with education freedom. Right. And so that, that snowball is kind of starting to build. Um, But if we don't seize the opportunity and seize the moment, you know, we're all going to be sitting around. I tell my buddies that are legislators, I'm like, you know, 30 years from now, we're all going to be sitting around drinking sweet tea talking about how, man, remember 30 years ago and we could have got rid of state income tax? Remember when we had like almost every single seat in the legislature and the most conservative governor in state history and we just decided to like fight with each other and not not get anything significant done? I mean, that shouldn't happen. And if it happens, it's on us. So, um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to be done, but we're starting to we're starting to make some progress. Brilliant. I, I I hope you don't mind me going a little bit rogue with this follow-up because I, I have to ask it. What, what is that like starting your own think tank, your own state think tank? You're in your mid thirties and you've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old. What is that? What is that like on the home front? Uh, I probably should have my wife answer that question. Um, I'm pretty sure she thinks I'm insane. I tell people that a lot, but in in all seriousness, like my wife has been from day one has been like totally, completely supportive. I mean, the minute I called her and said, Hey, I'm starting to, unless you tell me, no, I'm starting to think tank. And she was like, no, like this is what you've wanted to do for the entire time I've known you like 10, 12 years. And this is the moment, like this is the time to do it. And so, um, there's been a lot of confirmations uh, along the way, not just with policy wins and fundraising and all these other things, but conversations like that, conversations with friends. And, you know, yeah, again, you talked about challenges and I didn't have an answer. That's probably one of them, you know, work-life balance and just trying to figure out my family. My family is first uh, and my family is what is also why I'm doing this. And so it's very easy at times to think like, well, no, I got to work this weekend even if it means not spending time with my kids, it's because I'm doing it for my kids and they'll understand and they'll appreciate it someday. Uh, and they'll be the first ones to starve if we fail. But, um, but no, I mean, it, it, it's a concept. I mean, it's a daily, it's a daily balancing act of just figuring out how to keep it all in perspective. I think there's a lot of flexibility that comes with this work in some ways too. Like I can work from home. Some days I'm traveling. Some days I'm at my home office. Um, I get to kind of make my own hours to some degree. So that's been a huge benefit. Um, but it, it can be tough. This summer was, 
we were doing a lot. We were, you know, we were up for an SBN award. We were, did a lot of work to try to get votes in the door for that. And I had, you know, some invitations to go speak at some conferences about the Learns Act. And there were, there were a lot of, a lot of good opportunities, but also, you know, opportunity cost, right. Of being away from home. So it's a, it's a daily, it's a daily exercise to keep that in balance. Brilliant. Wow. Thank you for sharing that about what it was like you telling your wife about that and then why she said yes to that, because that's a leap of faith. But it sounds like she knew it was the right time. That's brilliant. I'm she so knew. And in and, and all seriousness, like if she had said no, I would have been like, OK, like this is a I mean, we, I probably would have talked her into it, but it would have definitely been like a red flag of like, OK, like I talked to 10 people. They've all said yes. Every, you know, all of my board members have said yes, like everything's falling into line, but like, what's my wife going to say? And then having that conversation with her and her knowing like, this is something that you've always wanted to do in, in a lot of ways. It felt like the last eight to 10 years of my career and other things I'd gone through even personally had been kind of preparing me for this. And so, yeah, I think getting that confirmation from her was, uh, was super important and, and it, uh, definitely launched us into the future. Brilliant. Okay. Well, just a few questions, because I know we're starting to be a bit over time here, and I apologize. Do you still have time to keep going, Nick? Yeah, I got some okay. time. Great. I always have time for you, James. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It is much appreciated. So you've spoken some about the biggest challenges that you have there in your state. You, you mentioned education. You mentioned that how state income tax and opportunity and things like that. So are, is that what you're seeing as the biggest challenges in your state? And then are they different from what you see as the challenges on the country as a whole? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, they're a microcosm of what we see in the country as a whole government taking too much out of people's paychecks. And, you know, we don't have a, as big of a problem with wasteful spending in Arkansas as some other states. Certainly, we've got a balanced budget amendment. And, you know, we, we, we haven't just completely exploded the state budget with Medicaid being really the big exception to that. Um, and yeah, when you talk about education freedom, I mean, I feel like that's the, that's the, you know, I've heard Condoleezza Rice talk about this and even say like, this is a civil rights issue of our time. I mean, it really truly is the most important issue in the country right now, I think. And so it's really exciting to be on the front lines of that, even in a, in a small way here in Arkansas. Um, but those are really, really important. The other thing I would say that's a huge priority for us, which I haven't talked about yet here today, but the foster care system, mm. um, the foster care system in Arkansas is completely broken. And it's not because it's not because there aren't good people involved. And it's not because there aren't good caseworkers and good people at DHS that are trying to do the right thing that are trying to help kids. But, the, you know, to me, the whole concept of foster care uh, is broken uh, and, and doesn't really work. Um, you know, it should be there. It's kind of like the welfare system, right? Like it, it should be there for kids that truly need it and truly have nowhere else to go, but it should not be a default option. It should not be, it should be difficult, I should say, uh, for, for kids to fall into foster care and to stay there very long. The reality is, in my opinion, having looked at the rules and the laws that we have in place and the policies here in Arkansas, it's way too easy for kids to get sucked into the foster care system. And then we have kind of this compounding problem of it's uh, way too difficult for good people to become foster parents. And so you saw even during COVID, during the pandemic, huge increase in foster care caseloads. But the average, you know, roughly average time for someone to become a certified foster parent in Arkansas is like a year. It's like 12 months. And that's, you know, on the good end of things like that's. You're doing you're doing good if you can get in within a year. And so you've got kids repeatedly sleeping in DHS office buildings in offices in, in DHS in Arkansas because we have so many foster kids and nowhere for them to go. And I think my approach and Opportunity Arkansas's approach and, and passion for this issue is really driven by, you know, the best place for kids the vast majority of the time is with their parents, it's with their families. And so are there cases where, you know, kids are in danger and they should absolutely be removed from the homes? Absolutely. And we don't want to do anything to, to affect that. But are there cases where kids are taken away from their families and on average they're tossed around 
in in four different home settings and the vast majority of them never end up reunited with their families. That happens way too often in Arkansas and the rules that are in place, the way that the foster care system has been run in Arkansas and and designed in Arkansas. And I think probably in in a lot of States um, are it's geared way too much towards removal and just the assumption that kids would be better off in most cases if they weren't with their parents and they were taken away from their families, the government can help them and these foster families can help them uh, and that we're helping by taking kids away from their families. That uh, to me is a a really bad premise. And I think that we've got some work to do in Arkansas and in other states around the country to reset our thinking when it comes to, to foster care. You know, uh, I started off my professional career just out of college, um, working in a, a group home for boys that had been remanded to it from the juvenile halls. And I saw, and that was in California, I saw firsthand that there needs to be help with these, with the whole system. It needs to be overhauled big time. Um, so I would definitely say it's not just in your state. I think it's something that's everywhere. And I'm really glad to hear that you're working on trying to fix it there. I think uh, future successes you have could probably be replicated in other states. And that's that's really hopeful to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a spoiler, perhaps, but maybe by the time this airs, uh, it'll be live. But we just did an interview. So we're, you mentioned we're really big on stories and like telling the, telling the story of Arkansans that have been hurt by government or helped by government. Um, and ma- I mean, they really are, our Kansans really are our mission and our purpose at Opportunity Arkansas. And so we just did an interview that we're publishing here in the next couple of days with a, a former foster mom. Uh, and it's just her story of like working with the state and, you know, the trauma that came along with her kids. And one of the things she says, you know, you, you think about kids in foster care and traumatic experiences that they maybe went through that caused them to need to be removed from their homes. One of the things she says in the interview is, the most traumatic day of my now daughter, she's adopted this, uh, this child now, but she said my daughter, the most traumatic day in her life was the day she was removed from her family. That was much more traumatic than anything that ever happened to her before she was pulled into foster care. Mm -hmm. And that right there, I mean, I think in a, just in a one thought in one sentence should really reshape our thinking around the entire system of, of how this is working. Because again, the default, it's just like welfare. We think we're helping people. We think if we give them this food stamp or we give them this Medicaid card or we give them a housing subsidy that we're going to help them. And in reality, a lot of times we're hurting, we're not helping. And I think foster care, the whole system is it's very in a similar way. Um, we're, we're hurting kids, we're breaking up families and then we're creating trauma for kids by taking them away from their families. And so Andrew Brown, good friend of mine, works at Texas Public Policy Foundation. He's on our advisory board. He has really like just changed my entire thinking around this issue. And one of the things he always says is the decision before judges and caseworkers, when they're, when they're deciding whether or not they're going to take a kid out of a home, should really be what causes the least amount of trauma, leaving them in their home or taking them out of their home. Because you know, and to the point of this, this lady that we've talked to here in Arkansas named Maria, you know taking them away from their family is going to create trauma. And so the question is, which path causes the least amount of damage to kids? And I don't know that that's always a big enough part of the equation when mm-hmm. these decisions are being made. Well, I don't think that the story about the level of trauma is being told that, uh, from taking your, the child away. So that's why I'm really excited. I mean, excited is the wrong word. Very happy to hear that you're telling that story. Would you uh, be sure to share that with me when it goes live? That way I can yeah. I can share it around on Week in Review and things like that. I know I know I always look at try and keep track of your stuff, but that's something I would love, love to see when it goes live. Thank you. So I know I, uh, we are running super long. So tell me, can you sum up what are your, your, your hopes and goals there for your organization? Man, that's a big question. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, I want people to know that 
Opportunity Arkansas is about Arkansas. You know, we're we're not about some sort of, you know, our, our, our tagline is homegrown ideas for real change. Like that's our motto. And so we're not just trying to take what every other state has done and cookie cutter it and force it into Arkansas. We're really about what's best for our state. And sometimes that might look like learning from other states and things that they've done well or things that they've done poorly and trying to learn from that. Um, but we're really about Arkansas and Arkansans. You know, I, you told me it was obvious, so hopefully it is, but like my passion for Arkansas is very deep. I think sometimes, um, you know, I'm misunderstood in terms of people, you know, somebody found out I went to a private school for like three years and now I'm some sort of elitist rich kid from White County, which is, by the way, like one of the poorest counties in the entire country um, that I grew up in. Uh, but I, I, I just I think at the end of the day, I want people to know that we're about Arkansas. We're for Arkansas. Uh, I hope they see us as a trusted source of information about what's going on and how it affects them. You know, we spend a lot of time with policymakers and with the public, not necessarily telling the news or like, you know, writing original news content, but trying to help explain to them the implications of what's happening in the news or what's happening at the Capitol and how it affects their daily lives. And so we definitely want people to, to see us as a trusted source of information of where they can get the truth about what's going on. A lot of these topics are really complicated when you talk about Medicaid and the budget and the income tax and all these things. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's really about Arkansans and, I have I have no interest in like force feeding my ideas. I got a lot of ideas. I think a lot of them are brilliant. I mean, if I'm if I have to, you know, put me on the spot, I have to say I think I got good ideas. Nick, why um, bother to Arkansas. have ideas if they're not brilliant? Why bother? That's to right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Just be spinning your wheels. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, like we got to figure out what works best for Arkansas. And I've kind of latched onto this Albert Einstein quote: the definition of insanity trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That's basically what we've been doing in Arkansas for the last 150 years. And so now we've got a, uh, you know, we've got a governor that's willing to disrupt the status quo and say, we're not just going to do things the same way we've been doing them. And so the moment is really now to figure out what that means. And like, we're changing, we're, we're going to do things differently, but how are we going to do it better? And we're we're playing a really important role in that and trying to make sure that we've got Arkansas specific ideas that work for Arkansas that are going to take us to the next level and make us finally competitive with with all the states around us. I love it. I love it. I, I heard you say that you want to have the next Dallas, the next Austin, the next Nashville. You need you want to have all of those cities there in your state. And I I am so excited to see it happen. So Nick, thank you for sharing all of that with us today. Last question for you. Who can you nominate for us to next be interviewed on Neighbors in the Network? That's a good question. You know, I have a lot of ideas, but I think uh, if you put me on the spot, I would probably go with my friend Jonathan Small in Oklahoma at OCPA, Oklahoma Center for Public Affairs. He's on our advisory board as well. And you know, we, we, we're giving each other a hard time, uh, a little bit of friendly competition about who's going to get rid of their state income tax first. We got school choice, education, freedom like a month before he did. So I've been kind of rubbing that in his face. Maybe you can maybe you can ask him about that. Um, but we love what they're doing in Oklahoma. And uh, I think he would be you know, he's got a really great story and they're doing really great work. So I would definitely nominate Jonathan for this. Great. I'll reach out to him after this and I will gladly ask him about education choice. And I also agree. I think their stuff is excellent. I always love saying what's, yeah. what, what, what the, the latest is from, from them. Okay. Well, thank you again, Nick. You've been so generous with your time and then just sharing your story. I have been completely fascinated and I'm so grateful to you. Man, thanks for having me on. This was fun. I could keep going for another few hours. So I'm glad Great. you cut this off. Well, let's let's do let's let's do that. Let's go on for another few hours offline, and I want to hear all about what goes let's on. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Let's we'll do it. Soon. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Neighbors in the Network, an offering from the State Policy Network. We hope that this podcast can serve as a place for empathy, understanding, and human connection. 
please let us know about your thoughts in the comments section. And thanks again.